deep understanding of American zoning and development codes and infrastructure planning processes. He has facilitated numerous public hearings and stakeholder engagement efforts, and his first mixed-use project as an, ex as an owner developer is currently under construction. Serving his ninth year on the Fayetteville City Council, Matthew is chair of the Transportation Committee, as well as the city's tourism agency, where he orients infrastructure and marketing budgets towards Fayetteville's broader strategies. Matthew's experience has taught him how to identify and overcome barriers to missing middle development and placemaking. He believes cities can build local wealth and restore neighborhoods by leveling the playing field for appropriate infill projects. So please welcome Matthew Petty to the stage. Maybe 
a little uh, trajectory for this neighborhood. This was a, uh, a diagram we did for Bryant, Texas when we did a pattern zone, uh, which is our name for uh, so more sophisticated pre-approval programs. Uh, we did one in Bryant, Texas. This is uh, what we started with. These are kind of uh, normal blocks. And um, the project area we worked with in Bryant um, had an average density of about three units per acre. I'm going to talk about density, but I hate talking about density. You should never talk about density. It's a deep word. It doesn't mean anything when it comes to the quality of space, and I'll prove it to you. What's really important are the kinds of buildings that are going in and who they're for. This is three units an acre, and you can just the kind of small, familiar buildings that are already on this diagram. Here's six units an acre. You might imagine that this takes something like five years, you know, for a neighborhood that people don't really believe in anymore, that don't have faith in, to start to see this kind of pioneering development, uh, hosted by locals. But these are all buildings that were based on the context that already existed, right? They're at very familiar scales. There's a familiarity principle here. We've doubled the number of buildings now with the same kinds of things. This is 12 units an acre. This is the kind of density where you start to be able to pay for a transit system. Or you start to have tax collections that can keep all the potholes still, or provide programming in the park, and so on and so forth. And then finally, maybe we have uh, some follow-on projects like the corridor, corridor development. This diagram is 18 units to the acre, which means that a transit program cannot just be justified, it can thrive, right? It means that commercial space is on corridors or at the edge of this neighborhood aren't just risky, but they can survive and be there forever. And this neighborhood feels the same to the people who have always lived there. I don't mean that it feels exactly the same, right? I mean that it feels so familiar, it doesn't feel like it was uh, uh, replaced. And I don't have anything against big projects per se. You know, renovating this building, a large project, is project that a community needs, but it's also the kind of project that you can't do over and over and over and over again, right? These kinds of projects should punctuate the community, should be there, they're a little bit special, but you can't rely on them. You have to rely on these smaller projects to build out the community. So this is what we've observed, and, and here, here's what I want to impress upon you. You know, I'm going to show you some case studies and what we're starting to think of as best practices. But if I could just get you to learn one thing today, um, it's what I'm about to say. And it's just this. If you have some old problems and you've just been trying to copycat attempts from other, other communities into your community because you think that's what you need to do or you're worried about doing something new, it's time to get over it, right? To get this stuff to happen again, the way we've been doing it for the last four years or longer don't work, right? And they don't work for certain people, right? And that could be by design. And they also kind of don't work at all, right? We've got housing crashes all across the country in almost every uh, community that's experiencing any kind of growth. Um, and what I want you to understand is that it's okay. It's not just okay. You have to start trying new solutions to these older problems, right? And that's what we think of when we think of pre approved building plans and we think of pattern zones. And the reason that we started to do this and to work on something that was new is because as planners, uh, and in my case as a city official, um, you know, I got kind of enamored with four-based codes. If, if someone could think four-based codes were sexy, like I was that person, then thought, you know, oh, it's a new thing. And I read a couple, we got some adopted and kept them doing continuous improvement uh, in my role as a council member. I get to help other cities do that sometimes. But there's this attitude that is wrong that we observe. And um, it's a very natural attitude to have in communities. And, and it's just this. Um, it's the notion that if we can simply change what's allowed, if we can just allow people, once again, to do things the quote-unquote right way, then they would do it. And that just doesn't happen. So many times we've seen a new master plan come out, new codes get written, get adopted, and so on and so forth, and then the developer comes in, a uh, big outfit, and they pat the planner on the head, and they say, that's nice, your plan is cute, I love the watercolor, but we've got our own plan. 
right? And we have a program that works, and that's what we're going to do. And it's so frustrating, isn't it? In Fayetteville, we have something we not so affectionately refer to as the lot split loophole. And despite having neighborhood master plans and a great downtown master plan and a full slate of, uh, of form based codes that run the spectrum of the kind of development we want, we're pretty active about rezoning. This lot split loophole is the primary way infill development happens in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and that means that it's just duplexes and garage houses on the street all the way down forever because it is the easiest way to get a permit, right? If you want to do a fourplex, or you want to do a walk-up apartment building, or you want to do a pocket neighborhood, the permitting process is harder, and it's very easy to walk in and say, I'm splitting the lot, and I'm doing duplexes. I have no stormwater, I have no tree preservation, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's this path of least resistance, and that's not an academic thing. That's in practice, right? That is almost always what the bulk of the marketplace for development is going to choose to do, is follow these paths of these resistance. And so it's really important to do more than change what's allowed, right? These are the three dimensions by which almost every developer makes a decision about what kind of program they're going to execute, whether they're a larger outfit or whether they're a small scale uh, a, a developer like me and some of the other people in the room. They're always asking not just what's allowable and what's marketable, but what is and what can I get, get done quickly? And what can I reliably get a permit for? And so that's what we set out to change. When we say that pattern zoning is a new technology for cities, we mean that it is a way to make scattered site infill as convenient as subdivisions or even more convenient than doing subdivision development. As convenient as doing a uh, standard apartment complex where you can go out and get a loan on the shelf, it should be just as easy or easier to do the kinds of small-scale, familiar development that we really want to see. And I think this is the biggest mistake that communities make across the country. And they think as long as they change what's allowable, then the rest will follow. But the hard lesson to learn is that you have to deliberately make what you want the most convenient thing. And if you aren't willing to do that, then you won't get the results that you're hoping for. So that's what pre-approved building plan, uh, programs are supposed to do. They're supposed to change what's convenient. And it's not just uh, convenience in terms of ease of use, there's also uh, some implications. These are real numbers. There's 2017 numbers, uh, bear in mind. I don't know how that happened. Good? All right, great. Um, these are real numbers for 2017 from a fourplex in Bryan, Texas that uh, was constructed uh, before we were able to implement the program there. It's one of our case studies. And uh, what we're saying is that if you pre building plans, you can save quite a bit of time and money. In terms of professional services on the architecture, you know, this fourplex is about $20,000 simply for architecture, and then some more for these other engineering packages that are often required. Not part of the pre-approval program in Ryan, Texas, um, but it's possible to pre-approve all these parts of the, of the plans. And this, these kinds of savings, this is $5,000 per unit in architecture savings, with direct savings off the top. That doesn't count the time saved in being able to get to market so much faster, right? There's usually, we can say, six to nine months of time spent on any project in conceptualizing it and working it out and revising it and then getting the permits and so on and so forth. Six to nine months. And we don't put a dollar figure to that because everybody counts their time differently, but it's remarkable, right? That is a, a, a remarkable acceleration because it's not just about making the permits happen fast. It's also making sure that the design, uh, the, the design timeline, the design work thing can also be more effective. And you might say to yourself, well, why does that matter? Well, it matters because there's, for example, a lot of people in this room that would love to do a project and have nowhere, no idea where to start. And we believe very strongly, you know, that public input or someone like me uh, shows up to a high school gymnasium and listens to a lot of people and takes a lot of notes, that's not good enough. That's kind of the standard for what we consider good public input. If we do that in a, in, in, in a, in a cogent manner, we try to provide space and, and variety in the times we meet and the spaces we meet, and we call that good public input. But for me, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. What we believe is that the highest form of public engagement is actually launching a system that people can access without having expertise. 
where people can actually execute the buildings and the projects that they would like to see the vision for the neighborhood and not just watch it happen. And that's what map zoning and pre-approved building programs are really about. Because if you can solve some of these problems, you can make it so that anyone with motivation, anyone who is trustworthy and diligent, ready to do the work, should be able to execute a project like this. Okay, let's get in a little to the nuts and bolts. When we talk about pre-approved building programs, we're not talking about replacement uh, for the way things get uh, permitted today. We structure these as uh, 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 standalone or complementary programs. They, that means they can exist alongside uh, the, uh, the, the existing zoning and development regimes. What that means is that whether your town has a form-based code or a conventional code or a hybrid code or is working through something new, this is an add-on program, right? And the reason for that is we are not prescribing that every project in these communities goes through this pre-approval program. That wouldn't be right. We have to maintain a way for people to get custom projects approved just like they can today. And so the existing system is maintained and this is run in parallel. We can also do this with a, a very, in a very granular manner, right? When we do pre-approvals, um, sometimes cities want us to do it in a way that enhances the local zoning and doesn't just slide into the local zoning. And so whenever we do that, we can actually do things like go parcel by parcel and make a map of where the pre-approval buildings are already entitled. So for instance, if you're in a community and you're like, gosh, I'd really like to make it so fourplexes were possible. And we know that they should be on the corner, uh, the, the corner parcels of this neighborhood. But you imagine to yourself, you say, gosh, I'm going to try to rezone every corner parcel in my community. What is my city council going to think? You know, what are the people going to say when I propose fourplexes everywhere like this? Well, I can tell you what they're going to say. They're going to say things like, you know, Matthew, this sounds like a really good idea what you're talking about, but how can you guarantee to us it's going to turn out the way you say it's going to turn out, right? Fourplexes sound cool, but what, was some, what about when somebody with bad taste comes along? Right? We hear these kinds of things in city council meetings and planning hearings all the time. It's a way different conversation to show a map of the quarter parcels, and you say, we'd love to have fourplexes here, everybody agrees. What we're going to do is we're going to pre-approve these six fourplexes, and here are the images, and here are the 3D models for you to look at, and then it's a conversation about how much people love those buildings, and how much they would love to see those buildings in their neighborhood, and not a conversation about what if a bad building comes in. So it completely flips the script on how we do entitlements, and how we talk about it. The other thing here is it's super powerful is when you, when you do a pre-approved building program in your community, it's voluntary, right? And when it's voluntary, that gives you a lot of power to impose best practices or architectural and urban design quality, right? As a community, when you have a pre-approved building program, you are offering developers who come in a new deal. You're saying, yeah, you can do anything you want under the existing code. We already have a process for that. Go through door A, right? Same door you can go through. Or you can say, we also have these, pro these plans that we really like. They're pre-approved. You can get a permit very quickly, right? Go through door B, and that's at your call. That's at your choice. And what that means is that um, because it's voluntary, you can require things that you know are best practices that otherwise you couldn't require generally, right? Maybe you don't have the political will in the city council or in the community to implement a new best practice for every single project that walks in. But what you're saying is you're opting in, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, project applicant, you're opting into this pre-approved building program and in exchange, you're gonna build this the way it's drawn with the windows in this location, or the eaves structured this way, or three gables instead of seven gables, right? You can also say things like, the parking has to go in the rear, or the trash can needs to be stored on the side of the house, or a street tree has to be planted for every project. And maybe you don't have the political idea to require those kinds of best practices for every single project that walks in the door. But when it comes to every pre-approved program, every pre-approval applicant that comes in, you do have the freedom to make that deal. In 
Texas, when we did this, while we were there, the state legislature passed a law that eliminated all design guidelines for any single household structure in the state. Um, and the way it was written, really poorly written, people were arguing about whether or not bedrooms could still be labeled on floor plans and so on and so forth. So it, it, got, it got really uh, um, kind of legalistic. But we were certain that what it meant was that we couldn't do things like prescribed materials anymore, or uh, we couldn't limit the height of a story and things like this. Pretty standard stuff that happens in design guidelines. Well, the city saw this pre-approved building program as a way to maybe get around that just a little bit because it's voluntary, which meant when they put in the application for the pre-approved building program, they are agreeing to construct the building as it's been designed. And so it was a way to still impose great design uh, uh, guidelines on, on single household construction uh, where the state legislature was trying to take that away. Look, at, it, at its core, I want to really simplify this. What a pre-approved building program is, is a community licenses a set of architectural plans. And then if they want to go farther than that, we call that a pattern tunnel when they go farther, and they put some of these extra programmatic components around it. Like these extra requirements for site design that might, might only apply to, uh, to these voluntary applicants. Talk to you about some of the case studies. And then we'll show you some of the examples of the buildings that we pre-approved and how we're going about um, opening this up to, the, to, to our network of colleagues and really trying to expand uh, nationwide. So first community we sold prototype to, this was uh, Bryant, Texas. Um, it's a very, fairly uh, well-sized community between the, the two sister cities there. There's a quarter million people, um, 90,000 of the population are students, are undergrad students. So it's this huge kind of lopsided of town again, uh, community, um, you don't see that kind of condition in, in many places in the country. And we got brought on as part of a comprehensive planning process for, a, for an area plan. So we had about a two square mile area. We needed to write a new code. Um, we needed to do some other things, a market study, that kind of stuff. Uh, and also, we did this, uh, this pattern zone for them. And in my end, because it was a comprehensive process, this was very uh, much focused on, uh, on how we were going to engage with the public. You know, so we had a uh, year's worth of different meetings in different town halls, and high school gymnasiums, and focus groups, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, at the end, we were, excuse me, we were elated at the end because the very last session we did was the architectural reveal. We did custom architectural design for this community because that's the way we thought we were supposed to be doing this idea of a pre-approved building program. We've changed that now. Um, but in any case, we, we did that, and you can imagine, like, there's this whole anxiety for being honest as, or I'm being honest as a planner, with whether or not the public is, if you translate it, what they've told you well enough for them to accept it, right? And the whole process, all these public engagements is designed to, to steer us to a consensus. So at the last meeting, we finally had these um, uh, 3D models printed out of the buildings. And people love them, right? They're going around, they're walking up, they're looking through the porch, and they're like going like this, you know, they're showing their friends. And you know, we thought we did it, right? We got ourselves on the back, we're like three inches taller going home. We thought we did it, you know, they're gonna get this adopted, and it's gonna be great. Well, it turns out, you know, it, it's not working as well as we wanted. And I'll just tell you, you can be self-critical about it. Um, I'm gonna show you another case study where it's very successful. This was a public program, and we thought it was a, a, a public focused program, because we thought the public loved it, and that meant the public would uptake the program. But even though they love those buildings, when the public walks in the door, they want to tweak it, right, to their own heart's content. So they love these buildings in a general sense, but even if they came in, they said, I'm ready to build one of these, we're going to move into this, uh, this house, or we're going to build it for my relative, or we're going to build it for a nest egg, or whatever. They love the building, but they still wanted to tweak it. And that goes against the grain of the pre-approval, right? That goes against the grain of an entire, uh, of an accelerated uh, review process. And so they get kicked out of the review process and have to go through a conventional review. And so it hasn't driven uptake as much. We learned a lesson, number one, that just having a couple of choices isn't enough. It's not enough. 
And when we look at the psychology of how people make choices, we find that, of course, you can have too many choices, but what we really need is we need 10 or 12 choices per building type for a grade three approval program. We didn't have that in Brian. And so the uptake has been a little bit limited. Professional applicants, which were not the focus of the program, but professional applicants, basically builders who are doing you know, a half dozen to a couple of dozen homes a year, love the program because, and they're not building houses with it. They're trying to build a walk of apartments with it. And what they did was they came in and they said, we're good at building houses. We'd love to do uh, more intense infill and we just don't know where to start. And they said, this is a program that solves all of uh, those problems for them. They can still focus on just getting the buildings constructed. The second prototype we did was Claremore, Oklahoma. Claremore was a wildly different town from Bryan. Uh, there's only about uh, 17,000 people living in Claremore. Uh, it's uh, inside the orbit of Tulsa in Oklahoma. And it's probably fair, they won't disagree with me, to call Claremore basically a bedroom community for the Tulsa economy. You know, there's a local community college and a little bit of industry, but it's, it's pretty much relying on Tulsa. So 17,000 people. Um, since they adopted this in December, last time we talked to them was uh, in the tail, the tail end of March, they have already had 28 permits in process in their downtown. So this is a town of 17,000 people, but the downtown is struggling uh, a bit, and they had building permits going through downtown before, in the years before we came there, but only a handful every year, and always the permit was, tear down this old home, it's not saleable, and let's put up a duplex or put up kind of a standard snap house with the garages and the trash cans in the front. And this is the middle of their historic districts and so on and so forth. Which is why they brought us in to solve this problem. So for us, in a community like Claremore, having a new system that generates 30 permit applications in three months for high quality architectural and urban design, for high quality site plans, us is a landmark change. We don't think that kind of result is possible without doing something novel. It won't happen under the zoning and development regimes you already know. And you look out across the nation, you look out across this state, anywhere else, and you'll find that despite having great plans, despite having quote unquote great codes, almost every planning department and every government official who cares about this and is clued in knows their attempts are not generating the results that they wanted. You've got to try something new. And in Claremore, this thing is working. This is the new thing that's working. Claremore is different. It's a builder-focused program. We didn't do public input because they said they'd already done it. They were bringing us in to implement the steps that came out of their public input sessions before we came there. So our meetings were almost exclusively with builders, which means all the architecture that got designed was designed to be constructed by uh, uh, firms with capacity. And we also did something really unique here. Um, within 90 days of signing up, we gave them one plan, and they ran a pilot to test all the processes. Uh, that's uh, what you see there on the screen. And uh, through that pilot, we were able to refine the program before we even launched it. And I think this is one of the lessons we learned out of, out of, out of Claremore in comparison to Brian. Uh, which is that uh, uh, you've got to make sure uh, that at least a portion, if not a, a majority of the program, is uh, tailored to people that are going to be constructing the bulk of the, uh, of the buildings. Okay, so um, that has been about what we've done. But let's, let's talk about how we've, we've done it. Because what is really of interest to us, when we call this a new technology, whether we're involved or not, we want to see uh, towns and small cities in Maine uh, and, and elsewhere adopting this however, however they can, because we think it works. And there's this constant issue of how you actually go through a design process when you're talking about something new like pre-approvals. Um, you know, pattern books are an old technology, right? And they, they predate zoning. They predate building codes. And the way most communities got built, especially the oldest parts of our communities, were simply people being inspired by the other building down the street, or the Sears catalog, or, or, or a pattern book that they saw on the last trip to the city, and just saying, you know what, I'm going to build it like that with a couple of tweaks my own ambition, right? No zoning or, or building codes uh, necessary at the time, and that was sufficient. And now, um, pattern books can still be useful, but most pattern books kind of at, at, at one level of are vision documents, 
documents, and at a more sophisticated level of implementation or a good sets of uh, design guidelines, what we wanted to do was take the notion of a pattern book and the way people could build from pattern books and turn that into a program that actually made sense for a municipality to administer. And so the way we start is we start um, at the level of building types. And there at the top of the screen you see uh, four building types. These are the types we start with in Bryan, Texas. From left to right, that's a cottage, what we call a flex house, and then a, uh, believe it or not, that, that yellow one is a triplex. We call the apartment house, and then last we have a walk-up. We start with those building types just to kind of get a little bit of a gut check with the city, and then real quickly we go to the next line, and we have, uh, explicitly we wanted to uh, produce variations on a theme. And so we went from building types, what we call prototypical variations, you see for instance with the cottage, now there's a cottage duplex, right here. A logical, rational variation of that building type. And the next line you see that those are fleshed out a little bit more. So for instance, again with the cottage we've got four more. The flex house, I'll tell you a little bit about it in a minute, we have some more variations. Each one of these is a different front. It might have a different uh, roof form, or it might have different uh, scroll work details on the eve returns. Um, they're the same floor plans. In the case of the walk-up, uh, some of those are brick and some of those are clapboard, right? So the notion here again is variations on a theme to make everything feel familiar, but not the same. Then here at the end, these ghost inversions. These are, this is representing the idea that when people start a project, to change things in the middle of it, right? And you need to make sure that there's a great threshold for something like major minor modifications or, or major modifications so that you can know what kinds of modifications can keep somebody in the program versus taking them out to a conventional review. And so we try to handle that because it's practical to need to handle that kind of stuff. You know, this isn't strictly a zoning program, right? We're dealing with the building permits as well, which means we have to deal with field inspections uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So here's the cottage. We started um, you know, with a visual preference survey in, the, in, in this community and a bunch of walking tours. And we invited people to submit to us photographs of buildings in the communities that, that, that they love, right? And we didn't need any other explanation except for that they love the building and that's why they needed to submit it to us. And this uh, 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 was modeled after a cottage, a 19th century cottage in the community that everybody loved. Um, it's modest, like a uh, and so we started with that. Then we have the garage apartment version, right? Then the cottage duplex. And then a fancier version of the cottage duplex, which just has a nicer uh, porch, uh, a, a double porch, you know, kind of like a Charleston single. And the notion here is from one cottage, we have four rational variations, and they're not just aesthetic. They're functional variations, right? And we entitle all of these for pre-approval. We also entitle all these to be constructed in different site formats. So these aren't just pre-approved buildings. Now, there are examples of uh, programs that just pre-approve the building. Uh, South Bend is about to launch one. There are a bunch of ADU pre-approval programs on the West Coast, especially in California, and a couple in Oregon and Washington State. That's just at the building level. And that's a pre-approved building program. When we do this other stuff and we, and, we, and we elevate the program with these other components, that's what we call a pattern zone. And so when we pre-approve this cottage, I go back to slide, when we pre-approve this cottage, we didn't think that was enough. Because we knew that we needed to do a lot more than just uh, uh, entitled new primary dwelling. And so we also cross-referenced these site formats. So here you have a very simple uh, kind of cottage square, or pocket square, and, and, uh, and a little bit more intense pocket neighborhood there on the right. With this cottage, for the first time in Bryan, Texas, they had a by-right pathway to backyard units, right? They have an ADU ordinance on the books. Generally, it's filled with poison pills. Nobody uses it. When it comes to the pre-approval program, all those poison pills are gone. That's how the city is experimenting with liberalizing their ADU ordinance through this pre-approval program. So that cottage is constructed as a primary dwelling, can be, it's pre-approved to be constructed as a primary dwelling, 
as a backyard or side yard unit and as part of a pocket neighborhood. We did some really interesting things here. Remember I told you, and I'm really going to try and lean on this idea, the program leans on this idea that it's opt-in, that it's voluntary. So here's some examples. Uh, in Bryan, Texas, they have no alleys, right? And, you know, like kind of the farther west you go, the farther west and south you go, um, the fewer alleys there are. And uh, so they had no alleys, but they wanted alleys. And so what we were able to do is we were, to, we were able to say if a pre-approved building is constructed and if the parking is put in the rear, which we were encouraging, then you're required to file a cross-access easement with the county so that when the adjacent parcel develops, they have a cross-access easement and it can run the full length of the block over time. And it might take 20 years. Right, for a neighborhood to turn over, that's the natural cycle of like one decade or two decades of earnest work is what it takes to see that kind of thing happen. But it starts with one project at a time. And so they saw this as a way to retrofit alleys into these neighborhoods. They also did some really banal things, like um, they literally did not have a requirement for where uh, 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 trash cars could or couldn't be stored. And the reason we were brought in is because there were a lot of quote unquote uh, stealth dorms being developed, um, which is uh, five beds, five baths, uh, uh, all under separate leases, and so on and so forth. And they were having some um, uh, a lot of enforcement burden whenever it came to parties and noise violations and things like that. And one of the things that was a big complaint is that there's a lot of trash left in the front yards after these parties uh, and, in, and in the streets. And so from Sophisticated things like requiring process and access easements to super, super boring, unsexy things like requiring a trash receptacle to be on the side of the house or in the rear yard. This city uh, was able to pilot those kinds of requirements through the pre-approved building program using the voluntary nature of it. I'll show you some of the architecture we, we developed and um, we advise cities to kind of follow this path, uh, cities and towns follow this path of think about the building types, then think about the rational variations that are kind of, that, that can come from that, and then, uh, and, and then expand those into fully developed uh, architectural plan sets and license those. And so I want to explain a few of those. There are the topics of the cottages we've already talked about. You know, you're looking into that three, uh, that three building uh, cottage square, and you can see there that there's two of the fancy Duplexes, and then there's one of the, uh, the simple singles in the back. Down the bottom, you have a flex house. We call this a flex house um, because it's about 1,600 square feet. It is uh, required at construction to be plumbed and framed as a duplex, whether or not it will be occupied as a duplex. Uh, and the way that happens is you see this door. This door is on top of the pantry, and you choose if it's a single family house, that's a pantry. If it's a duplex, you install a stair in the extra door, right? And it's already plumbed for an upstairs bathroom and an upstairs kitchen. And so what that means is that regardless of your stage of life, this home could work for you in your next stage of life. So we envision this as kind of the beginning of a of an owner-occupied multifamily program for the city. Again, remember, these, this program for Ryan, Texas was explicitly public-oriented, whereas the program for Claremore, Oklahoma was explicitly builder-oriented. Builders aren't going to be particularly interested in this flex house, but people who are building their own home are extraordinarily interested in it. This has made more inquiries for this than anyone else. Even though they still want to tweak it, and that's limited to the success of the program, is where the bulk of the inquiries uh, uh, come to. Up top here, we have an apartment house. We designed this uh, to fit into the single family neighborhood, a one story uh, single household neighborhood. Nobody believes that's a triplex when we show it to them in the community. And then at the bottom, we have a walk up. On these screens, everything you see in the render, including the black and white wireframes, those are pre-approved variants that are part of the program. So that walk-up in color is pre-approved. So is the three-story version that's all residential in the back. In the back, it doesn't have a corner store. To the right, we have a three-story version in brick. All those are pre-approved. OK, we're going to wrap up here. Here's what we learned. Because we told prototypes of Ryan and Claremore, we're proud of them. But they're early, they're new, we learned a bunch of lessons. Uh, now we're working with um, Overland Park, very excited to work with Overland Park out of, outside, outside of Kansas City. If you know anything about Overland Park, like it's 
Uh, but we're going to be working on Hot Pocket Neighborhood oriented uh, pre approval program there to handle the large lots. And these are the lessons we learned. We're trying to apply it all in the park uh, and some of the other communities that we're going to be working with. Number one, you know, we did like six buildings, four building types, and, and maybe like, six, depending on how you count, six to ten uh, variants uh, for Claremore and for Bryan. Um, spread across the four building types, that is not enough. Period. It is not enough. People need, whether they're choosing cars, whether they're choosing a house to live in, whether they're choosing what to have for breakfast, or where to go on a date, they want an ideal level of 8 to 12 choices. And that's just, that's just a fact out of all the psychology studies. If you have less choices than that, you feel like you're settling. If you have more choices than that, you feel like you can't choose. So we had to figure out a way to get more buildings to cities. We also needed to figure out a way that buildings, that, that towns could change the buildings that were in their pre-approved building program without having to go through the whole process again because we're pre-approving buildings and we might get it wrong. Or the consumer preferences or the town's preferences and goals might change, right? So we have to find a way of having a lot more, uh, a lot more buildings and, and give towns a way to, um, to change those buildings out on a yearly basis or whatever. And that wasn't working. Uh, it, that was the lesson we learned in Brian Claremore because we sold them perpetual architectural licenses. We did that architecture for those cities, not for anybody else, and they have them forever until the end of time, whether they're wrong or not. And they paid for it, right? And we can only deliver so many buildings for their budget, and that's a weakness. The other thing here is that, you know, um, most, uh, uh, most comprehensive planning processes cost $150,000, $250,000, and most towns don't have that kind of cash for these kinds of programs, no matter how good the program is, right? And so we've also got to find a way to make these way more accessible, uh, maybe on the order of tens of thousands, right, instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we think we've got the solution. This is the last thing I want to leave with you. This is what we're building now. Um, this is what we're doing for Overland Park, and this is what we're inviting um, all qualified architects and planners and urban designers and communities to participate in us with. Um, so we're building this platform out for pre-approved building programs. So if you're a community and you want a pre-approved building program, we see this as your platform for managing that program. We think the days of your programs living in a binder, in a filing cabinet, should be over. And it's probably still going to be a long time before those days are over, but we'd like to start. And so we envision something like a Zillow for every community that has a pre approved building program. You can imagine looking up a parcel. Imagine you're an applicant who doesn't know where to start. And you go to this website, and you click on the parcel you're interested in, and it tells you the buildings that are pre approved. And you can click one of these things. You can look up some other details. You can see a rational, reasonable, uh, uh, competent site program that goes right along with it. And with one button, after you've made your choice, you can assemble a package and email that off to the planning clerk to start your inquiry and start your application. And when it's approved, when it's verified that your eligibility was right and so on and so forth, when it gets approved out of the project review, which should happen quickly, then you can download a full plan set and get started. You can take that plan set straight to an architect if you need to make modifications. You can take it straight to a contractor for bidding. You can literally take these things to the bank and get your financing, right? So this is what we're building now. We're really excited to be launching some of this in 2023. Um, if you want to do a pre-approved building program and you're into that, but like you're not into this, you should still do it. You need to do something different if you want to address your housing challenges in, in, in a better way. One of the, the last thing I want to leave you with is, you know, um, when you look at this image and you imagine the first version of it, where none of these new buildings have been built, you can tell that that is kind of sparse. But you could also imagine, what if we added all these new units and we did it in one building? How disruptive would that be? And I don't mean just in terms of construction. What if that project failed? Now you have 
blocks of problems that you have to deal with because one project that was too big failed, right? And so we are desperate, and communities seem to us to be desperate to find a way to make scattered site infill actually work. We shouldn't have to tear down blocks of houses just to build more housing for people that need it. There is so much space in our community between the buildings that are already there that can be used so much better, and it's hard to figure out how to do that from scratch. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that hard. With a program like this, you might actually be able to make that easy. Thanks for having me today.